welcome to the Lit Up Lightworker podcast, empowering you with simple, practical, step-by-step -step spiritual tools and practices to follow your purpose and light up the world. You can access all episodes of the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and TuneIn. And be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos and interviews all about finding and following your life purpose. My name is George Lizos. I'm a spiritual teacher, psychic killer, the number one best-selling author of Be The Guru, Lightworkers Gotta Work and Protect Your Light, and today I have with me Madeline Moon. Madeline Moon is a yogic intimacy and polarity teacher who specializes in teaching couples how to make art out of their relationship drama. Madeline's coaching programs and online courses empower people to embody both the feminine and masculine energies for the sake of love in their relationships, work and lives. Her work and story has been featured in hundreds of podcasts as well as various publications such as BBC, The Huffington Post, Teen Vogue, Thought Catalog, Nylon Magazine, The Daily Mail, Vice, Greatest, Men's Health, People, and ABC News Nightline. And you can find out more about Madeline at maddymoon.com or watch her viral comedic reels at, Mad at, at Madeline Moon on Instagram, which I absolutely love. Madeline, welcome back on the Little Light, to the Little Lightworker podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's been um, such a pleasure just to watch your platform continue to grow and evolve and all the books that you pour out into the world. And it's just really sweet to be here. So thank you. I am so grateful to have you back to talk about your brand new book, Artist of Love, which I absolutely Yay. love. It's all about relationships and so much more than just relationships. And I'm so excited to dive in while I was like planning for this uh, chat today i'm like oh my god i have so many relationship questions i want to bring into it so i'm going to make this quite personal and just share from my own experience mm -hmm. and ask questions that i really want to know the answers of that i also think people will benefit from so before we get started i want to hear a little bit about your journey of writing artists of love and being in the space where you want to teach about that mm. Wow, thanks for that question. I haven't actually been asked about the journey of writing this book yet. And it's been one, it's been quite a journey. Um, I've been working on a book that wanted to come through for about, I would say, f I mean, really my whole life. I've been writing my whole life, waiting for like the book to come through. And in the past four years, I would say, I've done all these different angles of writing the same kind of thing. I worked on screenplays, I worked on a novel, and then finally I worked on a version of a nonfiction book that then shape-shifted into this book. So this book has had probably five different evolutions of shape-shifting into finally coming into being Artist of Love. And it started really nailing that this is the book I wanted to write, started from these comedic videos that you were mentioning in my bio that I started making. And I would, in these videos, do a take one of a couple fighting about something and it going poorly. And then a take two of what it looks like in a healthy, conscious way. And I wanted to make them funny. I wanted to make them dramatic. I wanted to make them all artful and show people how you can bring more love into a moment that would otherwise be a uh, void of love. And the love would be sucked out of it because of passive aggressiveness or exploding on each other and just an alternative way to be a little playful or be a little artful with the things that drive you nuts. And I kept evolving that by working in some of the modalities that I learned, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, with doing theater into relationship and how different aspects of theater or acting or improv can actually be wonderful therapy tools for couples and wonderful tools for learning how to be embodied both in your feminine and I'm sure your masculine, but primarily since I teach feminine embodiment, how acting is shape-shifting and how the feminine essence in herself going from being an ocean to a waterfall to a river, she is a shape-shifter. The feminine is a shape-shifter just like artists going from being one thing to the next. So I started working on this idea of the artistry of love, which then I was like, this is the book I wanna write and went heads down for about nine months of working on this extensively. Um, interestingly, at the same time that I was going through a breakup. So it was a very wild experience to write about, here's how you be an artist in love as I was also moving through grief, but it was perfect and exactly how the book wanted to be written. 
Yes, and a very powerful take on relationships that, and from an angle that I don't think many people have approached before, which is acting and theater and all of that. And as I'm starting drama school in actually like in October coming up, and I'm realizing how connected it is to spirituality and growth because to really mm. play a character, you have to understand the character and go through the motions of that character. And that gets you to confront different parts of yourself. And when you bring that into relationship format, there's so much transformation we can experience. But before we go into the transformation, I want to hear a little bit about the biggest obstacles that we face in relationships from your experience in working with clients while we are in relationships, first of all. And then we're going to talk about singlehood issues. But while we are in relationships, what are the biggest sticking points that you see being repeated time and time again? Yeah, the first thing that comes up for me is our our culture has evolved to come to a place where we we're saying things with our mouth of how we quote feel. And there is so much underneath the surface. For example, I have a friend that has come to me recently to be, be like, she's speaking to this new lover and she wants to feel more of him. She doesn't know what he's thinking. Does he like her? Does he not? Is she texting him too much? Does he need space? She can't feel him. Like, where are you? So what she says to, to him is, hey, how are you doing? Or I miss you. Or how have you been? How are you feeling? Rather than, I can't feel you. Where are you? Am I overloading your text messages so much? What are you thinking about this? The actual questions and the actual things that girlfriends or guy friends go to each other to talk about, like in the very literal things they say of like, you know, she's this way with me and I don't know. That's the stuff we need to bring directly to our beloveds. Right there, that raw truth of, I feel crazy with jealousy. And, you know, instead of a woman telling her partner that she's feeling jealous all the time and it's wild and uncontrollable and makes her feel a little nervous, she says instead, why are you talking to Samantha? You know, and it, there's so much of a deeper truth, like an iceberg, there's so much underneath that tip that everyone is saying to their partners. And it's the underneath that massive iceberg where all the juice is. If we just bring that truth to our beloveds of like, I feel fucking crazy because I miss you and I don't know what you're thinking and I want to feel you more. Oftentimes that's what the partner is wanting. They want more from you. They don't want less. And we've become as a culture, these poker face stoics where our faces are concealing what we feel we are keeping our cards close we're we're making sure our heart is not on our sleeve because that would be embarrassing or crazy or whatever stories we've created so we hold back at speaking what's really coming through and the answer as much as i love teaching um you know playful artistry or erotic artistry or ceremony or surprises for your beloved that always needs to live alongside what I'm talking about, which is going into the deep end of what's really coming up rather than these like little surface things that we say that are the pleasantries to caretake everybody's feelings and to accidentally mother your partner to make sure they're okay. And you don't wanna overload them with too much emotion. Overload them with emotion, be in your emotion and remember that it's yours to express and trust that your partner will figure out how to modulate their own ability to receive that and set the boundaries that they need instead of deciding for them what they can and cannot handle. It's so liberating you saying that because we're so conditioned by TV series, by movies, by books to just go to our friends and gossip and just overanalyze and think, what should I say next? Should I add an explanation mark? Should I add an X or should I not? Like, how do I approach things? Rather than just being honest with our partner and saying the raw truth, I feel there's something so liberating than saying the blunt, honest truth about how we feel to someone. I remember when I was going through a relationship situation a few years ago, and I, I would do that because I really can't hold things in and I don't like the games of like texting, etc. And I would be totally honest. My friends would be like, are you crazy? Like, you shouldn't 
do that, you're destroying the relationship because we're so conditioned. So mm -hmm. thank you for writing that and expressing that so powerfully. And I think it's a radical statement that I think <laughs> revolutionizes uh, the way we do relationships. For so many years, we're used to like, the millionaire matchmaker, the rules, you have to do certain things like following all these different guidelines. So it's refreshing <laughs> to hear something so honest. <laughs> the, did you say millionaire matchmaker, like the show? Yes, the show, because I used to watch that and, and, and then I realized how limited I was. I have to tell you, that has been one of my favorite shows for the longest. Patty, <laughs> the host of that, has for whatever reason just been like this idol to me. Like one day I know I have to meet Patty, even though everything you're saying is so true. I'm like, this is so ridiculous. and so not what I teach. <laughs> it's like, I always loved her so much. But yeah, you know, like the other, the other day I had one of those question boxes on my Instagram where I'm like, what do you want to know? And someone said, how do I tell my partner that I need space? Mm. And I gave like, I don't remember the exact three examples, but three different ways you can say it. And what will happen in a situation like that if a if a partner is feeling like oh they're crowding me they're one wanting too much time with me the normal go-to responses is not say anything because you don't want to hurt their feelings and make them feel like too much and so when you don't say anything a tumor of resentment starts to build within the partnership that's taking up space between you two you start to get guarded every time your partner comes because it's always starting to feel like too much and it becomes bigger and bigger and then you snap or you get passive aggressive and the answer to all of that to that tumor building between y'all to the resentment to the frustration is actually knowing that your truth it could hurt his feelings but let him have that experience of his feelings being hurt that's okay he will move through that but it's better to be honest and say my love I love spending time with you. And I also love missing you. And we spend so much time together. I don't get to miss you anymore. I'm going to take two nights to book a room down downtown at the hotel. I'm going to have me time and I'm going to come back and I want to ravish you and you ravish me. So you, you find a way to say, I love you. I'm, I want to miss you. And I'm going to be responsible for what I need to do rather than kick him out. Say, I'm going to go have a little me time and I'll come back and then I want to come together with you. That fixes everything. You get your time, you tell your partner with love that you need space, but then you're actually setting your partnership up for so much success in the long term by being honest and truthful about what you need. And I think that's part of the artistry is being really in tune with what you're needing and what the moment itself, what love itself is asking for the health of the whole partnership yes because it, it's honest but at the same time the artistry has to do with communicating in a way that's empathetic and assertive mm -hmm. because right. you're respecting both your feelings and your partner's feelings which brings me to the question of and i think this is my biggest question in relationships and i think many people deal with it how do you find the balance between falling into codependency and being obsessed with your partner and needing love versus independency being completely aloof. How, what is the midpoint? I've heard terms mm. such as self-dependency and interdependency, and neither has completely felt true. What is your truth there? Oh, wow, that's a great question. So I don't have any term, any scientific or relational term for what it is, but it's a feeling. And it's a feeling that I think, you know, I once heard, um, don't, don't just fall in love, commit to love. And I mm. thought that was, that kind of summarizes what you're asking to me because there is a commitment to continuously meeting the relationship day after day after day after day. I am very much not of the opinion that you shouldn't rely on your partner. I think that's bogus. I think the whole point, like on a very root chakra primal level of two people coming together under one roof is to make life outside easier because of what you do inside that's the primal base level reason of being in partnership is that you come you live together so that everything that happens outside your home is so much easier if you're not actually coming together in that very primal basic way of like let's each pay the bills together let's be an emotional support system together let's take turns taking the dog out for a walk you're missing out on a very big primal, remember, primal piece of the reason we come together. So there needs to be that as a foundation of knowing you have each other. 
at the same time that there is a remembering that each of you have your own systems you have different systems you may have we can look at systems in so many ways like in the enneagram you may have a four and an eight or in human design you can have a projector and a manifester or you could have um an introvert and an extrovert and all of these things including trauma this person's trauma and that person's trauma creates two different systems that are meeting together to create something new. So knowing that you're here to rely on each other and also knowing that you're just vastly different people, that equals giving grace and space to you finding what, what the things are that you can't ask of each other. Because there are certain things, like for example, you fall in love with someone who has a terrible memory and they forget appointments and they forget holidays well you fell in love with them but maybe it would be actually quite abusive to make this person who has a terrible rem memory remember everything because that's not their system that's not how they're built so there's certain places where we actually have to learn how to be agile and compassionate and stop trying to make our partners excel in the areas that biologically they don't excel in a lot of people that I've dated have not quite fully understand the depth of emotion that I have access to because I've dated men with masculine emotional bodies. I'm a feminine woman with a feminine emotional body. So to try to make a man that I'm with who has a masculine emotional body to understand the agony that I experienced, but all these different things, it's not how he, those people in my past may be built, but they're built in this area and this area and this area. So each partner is very different and it's important. It's a part of the ecosystem of the partnership to be like, these are the places we agree to go all in together. These are each of our specific areas that it's just the way we are and we can't try to force each other to change. Now, are we okay with that? Can we make this whole relationship work knowing this part and this part and this part? Can I be my own sense of, uh, can I be the be the strongest person with a calendar, you know, and you not be great with appointments? Can I live with that, that I'm gonna be the person who does that in the partnership? And that's the kindest thing to do is to not expect our partners to be everything, but to commit to the love, to commit to doing the work. I got a powerful visual while you were explaining this, that it's the perfect answer. It's the Venn diagram where you have two different entities and then they mm -hmm. come together. And then part of them is, is that union, which is a new entity. But at the same mm -hmm. time, you still have these two different parts that it's their own person. So they can exist as different entities, separate entities, but at the same time, they share a new entity that they created together. What a beautiful way to, to think about it. Now, um, Precisely, let's, yeah. let's move into singlehood right now, because many people are stuck in being single and they don't know how to move past that. From your experience, what is at the root cause or what is the most common root cause that you see behind being unable to fall in love or move into relationships? Mm. Mm. Um, there's a few different reasons. I would think Number one, I do get this question often where people say, I, I'm, I'm not able, I haven't been able to fall in love for a long time, which I'll be honest, is so opposite of any issue I've ever had. So I almost have a hard time relating to it because I'm like, love, 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 love. That's why I'm here. It's all I want to do is love, love, love. So there's, a, you know, there's a, a piece of me that is speaking to this as an outsider, not having too much understanding of what that must feel like. But there's a there's one thing that always comes up for me is can you be okay with this in this moment can you be okay without making yourself wrong for not having fallen in love or not being with your partner i think you know that's one of the most basic fundamental pieces of tantra is can you be a yes to what's coming up and knowing that god lives here so you're not broken nothing's wrong with you times are changing we don't need each other as much as we used to anymore so there is that that exists as a foundation of there's nothing wrong. And if you are craving partnership, if you're interested in partnership or you're wanting, there are a few pieces that are important to begin to look at for people who are, I guess, chronically single. And that would be some of those stories that have cultivated in your body since 
childhood, since what you witnessed from watching your mom and your dad, like a classic example I see oftentimes is that someone was raised with a parent, you know, again, since I work primarily with women, it's, it's a female client who was raised with a mom who uh, consistently was let down by all the men she brought into her life, like man after man after man. And those men either were abusive or they didn't like do shit or they uh, kind of screwed over the mom. And so the little girl grows up and she's like, I'm never going to let someone in. I'm never going to depend on a man. So they become a little bit, they become highly self-sufficient. They don't need anybody. They've got some stories that have been created around what it means to need men, you know, AKA you're weak like mommy. And so there are stories that create I, I say the shapes that we take. So we take certain shapes yogically with our body. We walk around with our stories. We walk around as open or we walk around as like, you know, New Yorkers or we walk around as, um, you know, sexual. Like there's certain ways that we live and inhabit in our bodies that send out messages of these are my beliefs. And so if you were raised as someone who grew up not to ever want to depend on someone, you're probably holding in your body, this tension, this closing off, there's not much breath in your belly, your jaw might be tight, you don't want too much attention to be focused on you. So I always start with the body. Instead of the beliefs, instead of being like, trust men again, trust that you can be in love, I start with the body. Can you at least breathe more into your belly? Can you relax your shoulders back? Can you walk through the grocery store as she who is ready to be seen? Doesn't mean ready to be taken out, but someone who is ready to at least be seen, one next layer, she who is seen. And I write about that throughout the book of creating these um, like stage names, stage names, and then embodying that as you go from the store to the movie theater and dressing as that person you want to be. So if you're wanting to attract a mate who is kingly, she who attracts kings, how does that person walk? How does that person breathe or make eye contact or dress her body? You don't have to change the stories yet. Change the body first, breathe through the body in a different way. And then those stories start to break up and you start to see things shift in your life and people start to come in. And then you go to, on to the next step, which is receiving people in to actually come into your life. I love this, these acting exercises. It's so like it helps mm -hmm. you embody different sides of yourself and be someone, well, be someone else to find yourself essentially and, mm -hmm. and, and be who you truly are, who mm -hmm. you want to be. So how do we bring that theatricality into the healing journey in relationships while we mm -hmm. are in a relationship and we're facing issues, whether whatever that issue is, whether it's like fighting or not connecting sexually or emotionally, how do we start bringing in this artistry, this creativity, mm -hmm. this theatricality into navigating that? Mm -hmm. Gosh, there's so many ways, honestly. It, like the ways are an infinite amount of ways, but I've created a few. And I think one of the places to start, um, there's a couple places to start. Like what is the... Um, I love to look at triggers because it's just like a perfect, it's on a golden platter. It's like, here's a great place right in front of your face yeah. that's ready to have art potential. So there may be a certain thing that triggers you in your partnership or in your, you know, in your life that you can create artistry around in comedic ways, kind of playing, tussling emotionally with your partner, being sassy, being sassy, being bad. There are ways you can be erotic. So you can actually like create, do an erotic dance in your favorite like erotic clothing for your beloved as you whisper something in his ear, like something maybe a little bit dark or maybe a little, a little bit risque that has to do with the trigger, like nibbling on his ear saying, you better pick up your fucking socks, baby. As you dance and straddle him. I love so you're, that. You're like bringing in both at the same time. You're gifting, you're gifting your body, your heart, your you're opening and you're giving a very real message. So there's artistic ways you can bring your sex energy into it. And then there is one of my most favorite ways that I consider to be incredibly artistic and incredibly deep is what I was speaking about earlier, that raw truth, that deep raw truth, which is what, which is instead of no, I'm fine, 
where when you're asked, are you okay? You say, no, I'm fine. Instead, you realize I'm actually not fine. My heart is breaking into a million pieces, even if it's a small thing, like my partner never brings me morning coffee or he keeps over burning my toast. In, in worlds that aren't the world I live in, I can understand how that would be crazy to like feel heartbroken that your partner consistently doesn't bring you morning coffee or burns your toast. But to someone who's a feminine being, those things really affect you. And like, it's kind of like, it's like sex ending too early or like jarringly, like sex jarringly ending and your heart wasn't held and you feel dropped. It's like that pain of being dropped in sex really fast and really jarringly, like having a conversation ending really quickly. The feeling of that can be found in coffee never being delivered to you. And there's actually something so beautiful about a person that's willing to just start crying in a moment because something affects them so deeply and just be like, ah, like I just want you to bring me coffee and love me and, and kind of over dramatize that raw truth. That's the key because I've worked with clients who have wanted to share this quote raw truth, like the heart, like I'm sad that da 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 happened, but they don't do it with enough fervor or enough amplification. So it, it ends up sounding a little passive aggressive. The jaw is closed, their shoulder is turned, and it's like, I'm mad that you're not doing da da da. It doesn't feel like it's the raw open heart truth. So it's a very simple switch. Just bring your shoulders to face your beloved, open them up and put your hands to your side and say, ouch, ouch. And if emotion comes, let it come. And don't fill the silence with talking. I'm upset because you did this thing and you never do that and letting the stories roll through. What's most artistic is to actually just reveal your feelings about something, about your partner looking at an, another person with big breasts and you saw it and it hurts you. Can you just open your chest and let your partner see the pain that's coming through? That is artistry. In a world where we feel like we have to over explain everything to just reveal without explaining is so impactful because you're, it's like going to a museum and seeing a picture on a wall. You don't have the artist whispering in your ear what you're supposed to feel and what you're supposed to think. You're just letting the art affect you. It's the very same thing when you just let your beloved see your feelings and emotions and you don't explain everything. They get to feel the imprint of their actions on you, which is the, which is so it's so artistic, like I'm saying, and it actually creates such a deep level of, of intimacy in revealing what that thing is and how it affects you and very little room for misinterpretation if you're not speaking or explaining how yes. it is. While I was hearing you talk, I just realized how much we're not trained to embody our feelings and to express mm -hmm. ourselves physically, mm -hmm. like somatically. We're just taught to overthink and overanalyze and just communicate in a certain way. And we've become good communicators, some of us, but other wise we are not taught of embracing our emotions mm -hmm. and even allowing ourselves to feel our emotions so i think the work you do is so powerful in the sense that you you encourage people to to feel their emotions and to move their body which is simple mm -hmm. things to do but because we're not taught to do them we don't even know how to start by uh, like how to start doing so Oh my goodness, I'm so excited for everybody to read Artists of Love. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast and sharing these, these fabulous tools with us. My mind is blown and I'm so excited for everybody to, to read the book. Can you please let everybody know where they can get the book? Yeah, so Artists of Love is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, um, paperback and Kindle. And you can also connect with me on Instagram, Madeline Moon, or my website, maddiemoon.com. Thank you so much for coming onto the podcast and wishing you a lovely rest of your day. Thanks so much.